Hello, readers. Welcome to 20 Questions with Your Favorite Author, where we ask authors important questions like, why would you agree to be on this podcast? I'm Kelly Lynn Colby, Editorial Director at Curse Dragon Ship Publishing. Our guest this week is Cecilia Dominic, steampunk author and clinical psychologist. By day, Cecilia helps people cure their insomnia. By night, this USA Today best-selling author writes fiction that keeps her readers turning pages well past bedtime. She prefers the trip versatile to conflicted and has been published in short story and non-length fiction as well as non-fiction. She lives in Atlanta, Georgia with her husband and cat. And if she's not your favorite now, she will be after. <laughs> Yay! I love that you laughed at that question because I think it's pretty clever. So some people, sometimes people laugh and some people are like, what did she just say? Was this a mistake? <laughs> what was I doing? <laughs> that was great. Yes, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Absolutely, Cecilia. We're so glad to have you. So how is it out there in Atlanta right now? Are you still cooking or did you get like some rainstorms through? No, no rainstorms tonight. It was just hot all the day through. Right? It's never ending. I know that Dragon Con is coming up. Um, do you mm -hmm. go to Dragon Con? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. I'm an attending professional. So yes, I will be on Oh, campus. nice. That's yes. pretty cool. Yeah, it is our favorite con and we sadly cannot go this year and we are so upset about it. Oh. There's been lots of warning. You. Thank you. We keep we're on all the feeds. Like Zafo would volunteer and stuff, and so we're, mm -hmm. we're on the feeds. And I was attending professional, and so we're looking at all the stuff on the on the feeds, and just so sad that we can't go. Mm -hmm. You know, life. It's a yeah. pain. Hopefully next year. Yeah, I don't know. We might get divorced if we don't go two years in a row. I don't know what's <laughs> going to happen here. See, did did you see his face? I know the chat can't I see saw his face, face, but they know. Yeah. They, they know very well. Um, so you write steampunk and urban fantasy. There's like a lot of crossover between the two. I, I really like that. Like they have crossover in theme and feel. So mm -hmm. I'm wondering what story elements do you like to highlight in your urban fantasy? That's a good question. So my urban fantasy, um, and this is definitely something I explore in my steampunk as well. It's... Mm -hmm. It has a big theme of identity, like who am I really? And who do I want to be? And with steampunk, it's because back then they were so constricted by society and societal roles, especially the women. But, you know, men were dealing with a lot of expectations as well. When I teach my history in the occult and Victorian times uh, course, which I have done at various conventions. And it yeah, has I was going to say, panel. that sounds awesome. <laughs> it has been a panel at Dragon Con um, with oh, Leanna so Renee cool. Heber. She's one of my faves. I love doing that with her. Uh, but yeah, we, we talk about how you know, men, one of the reason that they developed mental illness because they were under so much pressure to be the providers. Because of course, women of a certain class didn't work. So it was all up to the guys. Mm. So when it comes to urban fantasy, it's often, okay, crap, I can shift into this animal or... I'm a fae, but I'm exiled and I've been living in the human realm for 400 years. You know, what, you know, to what degree am I, am I what? And how much of this is voluntary? How much of it is not? So yeah, it can be fun to play with it from either angle. That's pretty cool. I love the the themes that come out with that. Um, and steampunk tends to be younger protagonist, not always, but it tends to have younger protagonists. I was wondering, is that true for yours as well? My protagonists are all adults and you're probably in their in their twenties. Okay. So oh okay. and here is here is the cat. Oh, what a pretty baby. Look at him. Yes, this is Timothy Mouse. <laughs> I love that. What a good boy. He's like, hello, I'm here now. I'm ready for my interview. Yes. His mom's been working at her office all day doing that boring day job and has not been here with a kitty. Oh, what were you thinking? I mean, that's I cruel and unusual punishment. Cruel and unusual. I know. I love it. Yeah, we have two cats and the one shorter haired one. That's the one that like only will come to me mm -hmm. and so jumps on me. And the other one is loves everyone. He's just like we put him out for straight. We, we had to go to the emer uh, emergency vet for him once. And uh, even while they were like shaving him and sticking him with needles, he was purring. That is what a oh. good cat he is. Yes. Um, He's such a, they were like, um, he can stay. We're like, no, you cannot <laughs> help a cat. But his hair is so long when I pet him, like you're doing now, it's like all in the air. And I'm like, I can't <laughs> breathe. I, I'm not allergic, but I can't breathe. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it's madness. It's madness. Hi, Dante. Um, 
so yeah, kitties, kitties are fun. The, um, when I first started to write, I had a dog and I didn't have any cats. And part of my bio said, um, I fully understand that because I don't have a cat, I will never be a successful writer. <laughs> well, um, obviously you had to get cats then. I did. I have two now, so I should be doubly successful, right? Exactly. Yes. <laughs> That's how it works. Um, so I'm wondering, so we talked a little bit about urban fantasy, but as you said, it works yeah. for both of them. What elements of your steampunk do you find most compelling? Like, why are we like, I must make this as a steampunk story? Oh, I love history. And I love playing with history. And of course, steampunk is alternate history, sure. which yep. um, one of the reviews that made me laugh so hard was a three star where the the poor reader said, well, this was a great book and a great story, but everybody knows that the Civil War ended in 1865. And I was like, oh, bless your heart. Um, yeah, unironically. Like, alternate. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Alternate history. That is that is what this is. So that was so in my steampunk, the premise is that the South kept the Civil War purely defensive. Gettysburg never happened. And so it's now 1870 and they're in a stalemate and coal supplies are running low. So they need to find a new power source. And they're hopeful for ether, which is the substance that Victorians believed that light travels through. And they're searching for clues for how to stabilize it in ancient art and artifacts because the ancients knew how to do it. So that was, yeah, Eris element is kind of, I call it like my Big Bang Theory meets the Da Vinci Code, where it's like my, my group of misfits going through Europe searching for, for clues while they're being chased by bad guys. How exciting. So you're taking Americans and running them through Europe in the late 1800s. It's a crew of, um, let's see, how many Americans are there? Um, one American one Irish dude, uh, two English dudes, an English woman, and a French woman. Oh, so it's all mixed. That's exciting. Yeah. How fun is that? Did you, like, get to go to Europe to do research? Oh, I wish. No, sadly. <laughs> that's no fun at all. I mean, that's part of the fun of being a writer, right? You could be like, oh, I totally have to go because I'm writing a story about this. I know. I, w I really wish. Um, someday I will get to the point where I'm making enough to buy it with my writing that I'll be able to write off trips like that. That's the deal, right? That's the mm -hmm. deal. We always say we started a publishing company just so we could travel more, right? Oh, yeah. There you go. Uh -huh. Hasn't worked yet, but we're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> someday. <laughs> it's not worked yet. <laughs> but but we'll get there. That's our plan anyways. It's our plan. Um, so you talked, you said you you... So uh, that's what I was curious about. She said it was like Victorian. I was like, but if it's in America, is that really Victorian? Like, is there, so the real history that you've studied, like, it's like antebellum, right? Like, what, what do they call it here? Uh, so antebellum is before the Civil War. Oh, I knew that. That's right. So it's still Victorian era because mm -hmm. uh, she was the, I guess she was the most prominent public figure at the time. Um I mean, so am I allowed to curse on this podcast? I can't remember. Yes, absolutely. Okay. You know, it could, I think maybe the more accurate term for the American history would be like, this is when the Americans are really trying to get their shit together. Mm -hmm. But I, I guess it could probably apply to any era of history, but this is like. <laughs> yeah, because we've totally got it together now. It's all straight. <laughs> Everything's <Yeah>. fine. <laughs> well, I don't know anyone ever has their shit together as a country, so that's okay. I don't mind that part. Um, yeah. But that's what I always wonder, because do they call it the Victorian era in this country, too, or is that just in Europe? No, it's this country as well. Oh, okay. That, that makes it. I have a story. This is pers for purely uh, personal reasons. Um, I have a stack of books over that I need to research as well. Um, mm -hmm. The Because I have a story, alternate history one, too, that I want to do after the Civil War. Mm-hmm. Um, that actually ends in 1865. For me, that's the end point of the reality, and then uh, mine diverges then. And okay. so I have all this kind of research and stuff, but I want to take place in Chicago because everything I've seen in Chicago is modern. So I thought mm -hmm. that would be really fun. So I was just, I'm like, but it, how can it be called Victorian? I, we don't have Queen Victoria. Are you trying to tell me we were always obsessed with the royals, even though we kicked them out? This isn't just a now thing. Oh, absolutely. And Ugh. when you think about it, there are Victorian houses here. The really pretty ornate ones. Oh, yeah. Well, the style for sure, right? Yeah. No, I understood that. But we've been doing Victorian style even now, even though it's not the Victorian era, right? So I didn't mm -hmm. know if it was still called Victorian era here. I don't know enough about history, as you can see. Um, but who does, right? Everyone has their little specialty, oh. and that's what exactly. they know, right? Yeah. 
I understand that totally. So of all of your characters that you have, so we talked about these two series, but I know you have some other ones, like some romance mm-hmm. that looked very interesting as well. Um, which character do you relate to the most? Probably Claire in Aether Spirit, which is the third in the Aether Psychics book, because she is a she's an alienist, which I loved being able to use that term. Yes, I love that term too. And she's also a redhead. And uh, I first came up with that story, like it came out of a dream that I had. And then I was like, oh, let me sort of make this into a steampunk sleeping beauty, but with like amnesia rather than sleep. And it just went from there. And But she's very empathic. She's mm-hmm. She always wants to help everybody. She always wants to, you know, fix everybody's problems when gets in trouble doing it. So yeah, there's, there's definitely a bit of me in there, but you know, there's a bit of me probably in all of my characters. Well, that's the true writer's secret, right? There's a yes. bit of us. and We can't separate ourselves. It just doesn't work that way. So if you want to know the most complicated people, the ones with the most complicated characters. That's, that's pretty, exactly. Yeah, no doubt. No doubt. Um, well, I love that. So which one of all of these characters then was the hardest to write? Ooh. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to think about the books that have given me the most trouble. So Clockwork Phantom was hard for me which is the second in that series and it was my steampunk fandom of the opera and i can't remember why it was so hard i just remember we were driving to mid south con and i was so frustrated i was you know practically as my husband said practically throwing my my tablet across the car uh which i was not (laughs) but that was his impression (laughs) he was like look you were angry let me tell you (laughs) yes I think maybe that one was hard because Johan, he's one of those characters, the hero, where he start, it's a redemption arc for him. And so he starts off just kind of a despicable cad. And, you know, sometimes they can be fun to write and then sometimes they just annoy you. True. Depending on where you are in the story, no doubt. Mm-hmm. 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 No doubt. Yeah, that can be very frustrating. Um, do you ever take inspiration from your real life and put that into your books? I would say the way that that happens is that because I'm a psychologist, I'm fortunate to have in-depth conversations with people who have different life experiences than me all the time. And so I get to live a lot of lives vicariously, even to the point of, you know, sometimes giving random parenting advice. Like today, I advise a patient whose little boy is having trouble uh, potty training on the marshmallow trick. I do not have children, but I know about the marshmallow trick. Mm-hmm. Which, if anybody's wondering, if you're having a kid who you're potty training and you're having a hard time getting him to do it or getting him to aim, put a marshmallow in the toilet. It has to toilet. be a he. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. No, that it, this is not an issue for girls. <laughs> no. No. So put a marshmallow in the toilet and give the kid something to aim at. Mm-hmm. It works. I mean, when you're tiny, that's a huge bowl. So, yeah. I mean, That is too. true. Uh-huh. Yeah. 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 No, it's very clever. No, we were lucky with our children with that one, let me tell you. We were lucky. We've been lucky a lot with our kids. And then your specialty is sleep, right? Correct. According to your bio, I just, your bio is very clever, by the way. That's funny. This is how you sleep better. Oh, but read my book. (laughs) Haha, no sleep now. (laughs) Exactly. That is, that is my intro that I give at conventions and it typically gets a laugh. Sometimes I don't deliver it as well as others, but yeah. (laughs) No, that's, it's very clever. I like that. Um, So sleep, why did you choose sleep as your specialty? Okay, well, no pun intended, but I kind of fell into it. (laughs) Oh, you should totally intend that pun. That should definitely be on purpose. Okay. Uh, I was getting ready to apply for my pre-doctoral internship, which for those of us who are getting doctoral degrees in psychology, we do an internship, which is an experience away from our little home clinics. And we end up, uh, you have to apply to it and get selected. And it's a very competitive process. And I knew I needed to get more experience. So I emailed out to alums of the program that I was in, the clinical program at UGA. Go dogs. And we, one of the people who responded was Michael Bruce, who has since gone on to be a famous nationally known sleep doctor, but he was working in Atlanta at the time. And I was in Athens. It was an easy drive. And he was also working in the part of town where my then boyfriend, later fiance, now husband lived so it worked out beautifully and at first he was like yeah let's do you know an afternoon every couple of weeks but we really hit it off 
I liked the work. He liked having me there. And so by the end of that year, it was uh, two days a week that I was hanging with him, learning behavioral sleep medicine. And then when I went on internship, I ended up matching at the Central Arkansas VA, which, you know, you guys are in Texas. So, you know, that Arkansas is actually a, a beautiful place. I loved my year in Little Rock. It was so much fun. It actually is pretty. I yeah. And I had an apartment where it was l- overlooking the bluffs. And so I got to see the, che- the trees change. And, um, you know, they call themselves Southern, which I was not. I'm still a little skeptical of because there were only two places in town that served sweet tea. Ah, oh, they're right at that border. Yeah. And a lot of the, the pronunciations were very Midwestern. Mm. Cantrell. But uh, <laughs> so I was... So I was it's a blend. It's a blend. It really is. And <laughs> but yeah, I ended up creating uh, an experience there that is still part of the internship, part of the health psych track. So then when I came back, Mike was ending was on his way out to go seek his fortune out west and become big and famous. And so I just kind of slotted into his job. And then a few years later, I started my practice. And so that is how I got into sleep. So it was one of those accidental things. I don't know that I would have ever thought of it on my own, but I'm so glad that I ended up there because I really love it. Like it's a, it's an amazing ma- way to make a huge difference for somebody in a relative short, relatively short amount of time. That's pretty cool. Yeah, sleep is super important. Talking to two people here on CPAPs, and I don't know what I did without Yay. them, right? Yeah, uh-huh, yeah, absolutely required. <laughs> we yep. religiously wear them and travel everywhere with them. I, I, don't, mm-hmm. I don't know what we did before. I was like, oh, this is what sleep is. I remember now. <laughs> yes, I don't know what you did before, but what you didn't do before is breathe and sleep at the same time. So it's good that you have them now. Yeah, it was it was pretty bad. Though my machine's like six years old now, so it's probably time to yep. do it again. Um, but still, it was pretty darn impressive. It's it's amazing what a difference it makes. Um, so, do you do that too? Do you like recommend people to go like get you know go get tested or uh, at this or do you point, just I'm, like actually talk to them? Yeah, at this point, I'm focused on insomnia. So oh, I'm gotcha. on the behavioral side. Issue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Gotcha. I started off on the medical side, but yeah, now it's just all it's all behavioral. Gotcha. So, um, so if you're up all night playing video games, <laughs> not <laughs> me, problem. by the way. <clears throat> yeah. <clears throat> yeah. Don't encourage him. Og, he was up all night. By the way, Og says, uh, son of a bitch. That's why my wife leaves marshmallows in the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, Og. Very That's good. Awesome. That's good. Yes. <laughs> and your wife's a genius. Um, and very, very patient woman. Uh, anyways, it's <laughs> <laughs> we have on this podcast, we ask very, very serious writing questions. So I would like to know, what weird thing do you collect? Huh. <laughs> um, I'm looking around my office because I, um, oh, there are a few dragons. Yes, dragons. <laughs> Um, crystals. Mm, nice, nice. Mm-hmm. And shells. Oh, I love it. That's, that's really a coastal thing, right? Like, do you go, like, have you, do you go to Tybee Island or anything? Like, do you, do you have like a coastal love? Uh, yeah, I grew up in Birmingham, Alabama. And so I grew up going to the Gulf Coast. And so, yeah, for me, the, the beach is the Gulf Coast with the, you know, with the pretty green water and the white sand. I mean, you know, the Atlantic beaches have their appeal as well. Like they have those nice long stretches of really hard flat sand that's easy to run on, but mm-hmm. they're brown. They are. And it's not the same. So, yes. Well, it's not all the Gulf, by the way. We're in Galveston. It's all brown. Like in Houston, we've got Galveston. It's all brown, you know, all through Louisiana. It's all swamp, right? It's all brown too. You were just Mm -hmm. lucky to be in Birmingham. You got all the pretty stuff. Yeah. So yeah, Dustin's about, it's an easy like four hours south, especially since they've taken a lot of the little bitty roads that I remember my dad taking. Remember with the triptychs, those maps? (laughs) (laughs) It was like, oh, 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 here we go. Flip it over. (laughs) (laughs) Quick, where do I turn? (laughs) Yeah. There are a lot of turning around back then. Lots of U-turns. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I'm sure, you know, half your listeners are not going to have any idea what we're talking about. Oh, no, half okay. of them will. <laughs> yeah. So for those who don't, 
Um, we used to use paper representations of the world to get around. This is crazy. Madness, I tell you. Madness. Yes. <laughs> you didn't need satellite or internet or anything. That's right. You just had to know how to read a map. It's not that hard. It's really not. Yes. Um, no. Yeah, we went, we vacationed with our best friends in Destin once and it was gorgeous. So that was a yes. very lucky, lucky childhood for you. Let me tell you that water was beautiful okay. and there were dolphins everywhere. Yes. And so, yeah, my husband and I still go down to go down to the Gulf Coast. And yes, I will usually because, some, you know, I'm a very goal oriented person. And so sometimes I just need to go collect some seashells. Yeah. Yeah. You're like, that's it. This is my collection. I must go do it now. Mm -hmm. I think that's fair. It's fair. It doesn't eat up your life, right? No. Mm -hmm. So we talked about little so collections. You talked about the dragons you collect. Do you have any like cool, like mythical creatures in your books? So let's see, who do I have in my books? I've got a gargoyle hero in the Fey Files. I've always loved gargoyles. And they're kind of like dragons. Uh, I do have one dragon. He is a dragon who lives in the collective unconscious and he is gay and vegetarian and he's hilarious. His name is Infandel. Yes. And they so have Fey, and then I have a Grimalkin who is um his physical form is cat, and he can transform mm -hmm. into a panther with big bat wings. And he came about because I started uh, the Shadow Project, the first of the Fey Files, for Nano Rimo in 2019. And we were up at my parents' place in Blairsville in the North Georgia Mountains. And I can't bring my cat because my mom's really allergic to him. Mm -hmm. And he probably wouldn't want to travel anyway. He's a, he's a little bit neurotic. So he's a cat. Yeah. He's a cat. Yeah, he's he's neurotic even for a cat. Um yeah, that's why he's named Timothy Mouse. <laughs> because he's when like, he came I'm to shy us, and quiet. Yes, because when he came to us, he was tiny and gray and scared of everything and had big ears. And he's Aww. since grown into his ears, but he's still scared of everything. But I was really missing him. And so a gray kitten with one white paw made it came into the Shadow Project in the first chapter, and Sir Raleigh was born. Oh, yes. That's so funny. Did you dedicate the book to Timothy? Did you? No. <laughs> no, because it came out in spring of 2020. So I I dedicated it to the frontline workers and the scientists. Yep, that makes sense. Well, your job now, like, has it changed since 2020? Oh, my gosh. Yes. So... Mm -hmm. Prior to 2020, I was doing telehealth maybe a couple times a month. Like if there was a, a patient who was in, you know, I'm in Atlanta. If I had somebody who was in Savannah, I had somebody who was in Macon. And of course, they didn't want to drive into the city mm -hmm. all the time. So, you know, I would do telehealth occasionally, which I'm thankful that I did because we were already set up for it. And I say we, not the royal we, but uh, my, my contractors and I were already set up for it. Mm -hmm. And we had already taken our ethics training and we knew what we were doing. So when, uh, when the pandemic hit, yeah, of course, we were not seeing patients in the office. Mm -hmm. And we suddenly went from just a little bit of telehealth to all telehealth. And we didn't see patients in the office for, yeah, a good year or more. Which was wild because I signed a five-year commercial lease in uh, February of 2020. Oh, painful. Yeah. Yeah. Painful. Yeah, we started our publishing company. First book came out in, in January 2020. So, yeah, mm. we feel your pain. Yeah, we feel it a lot. Um, interesting. So, you get – has there been, like, a change in sleep patterns since 2020? Yes. The most interesting thing that I've noticed is that with people do, working from home more, mm -hmm. they are more likely to stay up later at night, whether it's the revenge bedtime procrastination phenomenon or the, oh, well, you know, my office is no longer a half hour commute away. It's just down the hall. So let me go get a couple more things done. And also, Sefo, you might need her card. <laughs> I think Texas is a CyPAC state. Uh, which has been another thing that has come up with during the pandemic is like they were already working on it beforehand. Um, mm -hmm. So SIPAC is an interjurisdictional compact of states. And if you are a psychologist and you're licensed in a SIPAC state and you have, you are part of the SIPAC, whatever it is, consortium, then you can do telehealth with people in other 
CIPAC states. Whereas, you know, previously we were, we were limited by our licenses to our state. And prior to the pandemic, states were kind of trickling into CIPAC. And at this point, I think there's only like five or six missing. Hmm. Yeah. Knowing our luck, it would be Texas. Can I just tell you that right now? No, I think fairs. I think it's South Dakota, California, Washington, Massachusetts, and New York. And I also don't think Hawaii and Alaska are in. Gotcha. Yep. Gotcha. Ogg's out of luck. Yeah, that's okay. He says staying up longer is definitely a problem for him. Um, but he's mostly just watching Zapho fight a shark. So, you know, he's got <laughs> issues, but it's not really insomnia. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There you go. Yeah. And the, the other thing that I've noticed is that people without having that morning commute are more likely to sleep later. And mm -hmm. so as things were opening up, we started getting people coming in with, okay, please help me to shift my schedule earlier again. Yeah, it's crazy. Like I was always a get up early and go, I would go to bed early and wake up early. That was just my natural. But after 2020, it was just like you said, it did shifted. So now I'm starting to get back into it because this is, mm -hmm. I'm not as productive at night as I am in the morning. So it's stupid to sleep in and stay up, right? It makes no sense. <laughs> not for me. <laughs> for mm -hmm. me, I need to get up. Um, so that's incredible. It's really fascinating. Um I just love what people do. So for this stuff that you're studying, right? So all the sleep stuff and any of that, mm -hmm. does any of that come into your books? Like, do you have like magic in their dreams or do you have like, is there any kind of cool bit that pops up in there? The Dreamweavers and Truth Seeker series, which starts with the novella Truth Seeker and then Tangle Dreams and Web of Truth. It does take place partially in the collective unconscious where it's like, okay, I've tried to keep my career separate and nope, we're just, we're just going to go for it. Uh-huh. Yeah. I think it's healthy, man. I mean, when you know yeah. something, when they say write what you know, that's what they mean, right? So you have a very unique perspective on that. So that would be really fun, I think. So that's cool. So you've got the you've got the series that we've talked about now, right? You've mm -hmm. got the Fae one and we've got the steampunk one. And is there like something that you're like dying to get to that you just haven't had time for yet? Oh, yes. Yeah. So there is a spinoff from the Fae Files, which is a spinoff from the Lycanthropy like, Files. I guess it would be a spinoff of a spinoff. <laughs> but <laughs> I wrote the Fae Files intending for this character to have her in the series. There's a young woman named Kestrel who is, she's That's a beautiful uh, name. Yeah, I've, I've always loved that name. Mm -hmm. She, so she's, her parents are witches, but her magic is really wonky. She, and they can't figure out what's wrong with her or, and mm -hmm. so uh, that does drive some of the the plot in the first book and I won't spoil and tell you what she is, but um, I do want to, I do want to write her trilogy at some point. And for a while I was one of those authors who bought covers before writing mm -hmm. books and I bought covers and I have, so yeah, I know I need so to. So you have to write it. Exactly. Uh huh. Yeah. Yes. And then I yeah. can tell you guys about my current top secret project. Oh yes. Let us hear. So um, my top secret project is I have a three book contract with Falstaff Publishing. And it oh, is a time. John Hartness is awesome. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And um, it is a time travel fantasy adventure with a bisexual heroine. Mm -hmm. And it takes place partially in Birmingham, Alabama in 1999, which sadly felt like writing historical fiction. Right. Well, it has been 20 some odd years now. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. And then um, partially in Constantin Constantinople in different periods of history. So um, also partially in like the late 1890s and mm -hmm. actually early in the 1890s. And then in um, I'm about to start writing in medieval Constantinople. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, totally. There's got to be traveling in there. I'm. Uh, what's the point to writing mm -hmm. all this stuff if you don't get to actually research it in person? Oh, yeah. And uh, Istanbul is totally on my bucket list. Yes. Mine, too. I need to Egypt first, though. I'm dying for Egypt, man. We're going to Germany first, though, but because I've already been. But some of our friends hadn't, so they wanted to go. And I'm like, that's mm -hmm. why we can go to Germany oh, again. Oh, yeah. Germany's beautiful. Yeah, I love Germany. There's a lot to and, it. Mm -hmm, and there's a lot to see. So that, that'll be a fun trip. But, man, I want to see Egypt so bad. Yes. Sure. Um. Safe, I was trying not to do something. All right, we had a question from Friday Blue. Technically, Dante, uh, her son, uh, Dante wants to know, do you utilize towers in your world? Towers as in settings and towers? Yes. 
Okay. Dante's a little young, so he loves that kind of stuff. Ah, He's also a big okay. train person. Gotcha. Oh, well, definitely trains in my steampunk. I mean, you can't have steampunk without trains. You can't. It's required for sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. As for towers, that's a good question. I There is, um, oh, there are definitely castles in the Fae File series because it does take place partially in fairy in the in that dimension. Mm-hmm. So that would be one. Um, I'm trying to think about it if there are other other towers. I don't know. I might have to ponder that and get back to you. But I would say, yeah, definitely the um, definitely in the Fey realm. In fairy. Yes. So yes, Dante, there are towers. But more importantly, trains. I mean, come on, trains are cooler anyways. Trains, airships. I mean, the art of piracy takes place almost completely on an airship. Oh, it's so cool. That's Are why you... I like steampunk. I just yes. think it's so fun. Um, just the, like, let's face it, ridiculous technology. That's so fun. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah. Like, one of the fa- one of my favorite things that I came up for it were my little spy butterflies. <gasps> so What? They have a little wax cylinder in it, and they if they fly close to you, then they have a little thing that will etch on the glass cylinder, and then uh, whoever is controlling them can get them, and it's basically they like they've got a recording. That's so cool. I mean, why not? It's vibrations in the air, right? So if it's exactly. recording it, that's so clever. How much fun is that? And Dante sends high fives. Oh, high thank five. you, Dante. High five. <laughs> it's awesome. Um. So let's see, we talked about a lot about mystical creatures, a lot about all kinds of cool things. Um, we have some fun questions that we like to ask at the end that mm-hmm. are, we like to call it our lightning round. Um, but, you know, you can answer longer if you want to, because it's fun. Okay. So the first question is, what is your favorite flavor of ice cream? Anything with chocolate. And so currently my favorite, because I can't do a lot of cow dairy, mm-hmm. is... The uh, Ben and Jerry's non-dairy chocolate fudge brownie. Ooh. We watch, um, we're a little addicted to Food Network, and mm-hmm. they're doing the beach, the beachfront brawl. And one of the contestants on that made ice cream with, um, it was with uh, uh, coconut milk and um, avocado. And I was Ooh. like, oh my gosh, that looks so good. I don't even have an ice cream maker. And I'm like, oh, I want that so bad now. We might have to get an ice cream maker just so I can try it. I don't even have a recipe. We're just going to make it up. It'll be fine. But oh my gosh, it looks so good. Um, What would you eat for your last meal? Mm. Well, I am half Italian, even though I don't look half Italian. That part doesn't show. Um, but I am definitely your type A Italian. <laughs> So it would definitely have to be something have something with pasta. So maybe a little bit. Well, if it's my last meal, I don't have to worry about dairy, right? So let's go right. with the, can, the cannoli. There you go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. Your last meal, eat something you can't normally eat. That's totally yeah. fair. Yeah. Actually, sorry, I meant to say uh, cannelloni because it's the you know the meat stuffed tubes with both the tomato sauce and the cream sauce. Oh, with not it. the dessert. The meat. I got gotcha. you. Yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. It's like you're not. But you know, and then um, I do weirdly love salad. So, you know, with salad and then a good garlicky bread, because again, last meal, who's going to care? And then, but then, yes, then a, a cannoli and also chocolate mousse, because I can have both. Yes. It's your last meal. <laughs> Bring yeah, it all exactly. on. Uh, um, I think the only requirement for my last meal is I don't have to wash the dishes. Um, there you go. Oh, and a good wine. Definitely a good wine. A couple bottles. It's the last one. There you go. Yeah. I think that's fair. Uh, what was the last movie you saw in the theater? Um, Crazy Rich Asians. When you haven't been to the theater in <laughs> decade, like, isn't that how? <laughs> I rarely go to the theater. Um, I like my husband and I typically just watch movies. You know, here we have a we have a nice big TV, mm-hmm. and but occasionally my gay besties. And I would go to the theater prior to, yeah, prior to the pandemic. And yeah, Crazy Rich Asians was 2019. Well, your gay besties need to take you back out again. Yes. Yes, I yeah. agree. We we are already looking at, I've already made a request for the new uh, Ergo Poirot movie, Death and Venice. I'm, I am dying for Willy Wonka. Oh. It looks so good. It's Timothy Chalamet, and it's before 
like the 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 part C right right Timothy Chalamet and it's before and he's just watching him play you've got to watch the trailer just trust okay. me we're done with this interview look up the trailer it is on YouTube Willy Wonka looks it's like around Christmas of course it is and I'm like no mm -hmm. I want to watch it now but it makes me cry because it's everything you want right it's got that whole discovery thing and that whole magic and the just you know, unquenchable optimism. It's mm -hmm. just exactly what Willy Wonka is supposed to be, right? He was supposed to be weird, not creepy. Mm -hmm. And so yeah. just watching him do that, oh my gosh. And by the way, I actually kind of like Johnny Depp's Willy Wonka, but that's not what mm -hmm. I wanted, right? So the yeah. Timothy Chalamet, oh my gosh, I am so excited. I'm so excited. Okay, so. yes, I will definitely have to look that up. Oh my gosh, it looks so good. And I think it's going to be a musical too, which excites me even more because I love musicals. Uh -huh. They make me happy. How do you feel about yes. musicals? Oh, I love musicals. Right. Yes, my I husband and I have season tickets to the Fox Theater, so we get to go see musicals. Like we just saw Wicked a couple of weeks ago. Oh, we love Wicked. Yes. We, I've actually been listening to Wicked for no apparent reason. I just wanted to. Oh, well, there you go. Mm -hmm. That's all the reason I need. Mm -hmm. No, we laugh because Wicked, we, that's uh, Zafo's gateway. Because I grew up on musical <laughs> theater, right? You know, right mm -hmm. outside Chicago, Chicago, we grew up on it. I love musical theater. We are always involved. Um, stage manager, I can't sing. Sorry to disappoint anyone. Cannot sing at mm -hmm. all. But always involved in it. And then, so I've seen tons of them, loved them. And then Wicked was like the one that i have fallen in love with and never had time to go see. Um, and then had no money to go see, right? Mm -hmm. You know, that you mm -hmm. get to that stage in your life with young children. And then, so my mom for my birthday sent me Wicked tickets. And Zafo's oh. like, oh, I don't know, music. Uh, here in Houston, right? We're in Houston. She's like, here, I bought you tickets. Go see it, right? And I'm like, oh, I'm so excited, Zafo. And he's like, I mean, I'll go. Because he's, mm -hmm. he's the guy that likes the action movies, but who also go to the romances, right? Like, mm -hmm. he likes both. And so I was like, I'm, it's really good, I promise. And he's like, it's fine. I mean, I haven't seen one. And then he was like, dude, I love musicals. And we did the same thing. We bought season passes. <laughs> nice. <laughs> And then we spent too much money, so we don't get season passes anymore. Um, Because <laughs> with season passes comes the going downtown and eating the fancy meals. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we don't do that anymore. Um, if you could tame any wild animal and bring it home, what would it be? Mm -hmm. mm. Like, assume it's not going to rip your face off or, you know, eat your cat. It will be tame. Yes. I would have to go with something like a red-tailed hawk. So I just absolutely love hawks. And we have them here. And mm -hmm. my office is on the, well, I guess it's technically the fifth floor of the office building. It's four, it's, they say it's 4-4, four, four, but we have a terrace level. And mm -hmm. so it's right on the level where if the hawks are flying around, like there's a, a pair that lives in the cemetery nearby, which I also have a view of the cemetery, mm -hmm. uh, Memento Mori. And, but yes, yeah, the, perfect, the perfect place to, to see them. Oh, that's really cool. I love that. No, I grew up behind a cemetery. I think there's something magical about cemeteries. They actually don't mm -hmm. creep me out. I think it's really cool. And you love history, right? I yes. can see that. Yeah. Have you ever been to, through a cemetery and something just like sparked your interest and you like couldn't walk away? Not yet, but I am mm -hmm. open to the possibility. I mean, I do like big fancy tombs. Like I've definitely been to, you know, been to New Orleans and... Yeah, and it's um, my husband and I used to go to old cemeteries and be like, see who could find the oldest grave. Yes, yes. And the ones you can't read anymore. Like, I'm trying to read it. And I can't tell yeah. what year that is. Yeah. yeah. And then when we were um, when we were in Scotland, we mm -hmm. took a course on uh, like Scottish towns and cities, and part of that was cemeteries, and found out what some of the symbols on the on the gravestones meant, well, which that's was interesting. Fun. Yeah. yeah. I love cemeteries. I don't know. I guess because life is short, so it's nice to know that there were people here before and there will be people here after. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I find that comforting. Yeah. 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 I like it. Um, what TV show is your guilty pleasure? Right now we're watching Ted Lasso, which I'm bummed that that's over. I'm, I don't think that's guilty pleasure. I mean, everyone should be watching yeah. Ted Lasso. That's not guilty. Okay, so I have to admit that, like, this horrifies my husband, but I am fascinated by Wife Swap. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes. Well, think how other people live. No, I think that's cool. 
Yeah. And it's like just taking these, these people and putting them in a completely different environment. And like, you know, the first week they have to go by the rules of the environment and then the second week if they get to make changes and it's, yeah, I think it's just so fascinating. Well, that's got to be cool. I mean, people like to gawk, but for you as a psychologist, that's got to give another dimension, right? Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Um, I always lose my place. One of these days, I need to like have a marker that shows me like exactly where I am, mm-hmm. you know, so that we have the, yeah. Well, here, have a cat tail. There you go. Look <laughs> at that. What a beautiful kitty tail. He's not skittish at all. I have no idea. You know what he's doing? He's like, you're talking. You must be talking to me, mom. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. <laughs> must be me. <laughs> I here, love Want to come snuggle? Come on. He's like, yes, me please. Speaking. Oh, oh, and he talks too. He wants to answer questions. Tuna or salmon? <laughs> <laughs> oh, his his favorite uh, wet food is the the uh, science diet salmon feast. So salmon, there you go. Tuna yes. or salmon? Salmon it is. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The- <laughs> All right, Og, that's funny. It's another show we watch. He's, he says that Kelly and Smashy, if me and Smashy switched, oh, that would be fun. Oh, <laughs> that would be fun. Because um, her husband's a scientist. I'm very much scientist. So us trading and then her, com- that would actually, that would be a lot of fun. We should totally do that, Og. Oh, yeah. Like, yeah. I don't even know if the show is on anymore. Like, I used to catch it when I was at the gym and just flipping through the channels on the television. Well, you want something mindless when you're at the gym. So oh, that totally yeah. makes sense to me. You want to forget what time it is, right? Yeah, you need to do that yeah. 100%. Yeah. And I'm not one of those psychopaths who's going to sit there and watch the food channel at the gym while everybody else is sweating and starving around you. I don't know, man. I love the food channel. Let's face it. Half of it's competitions and not actually food anyways. It's fine. Oh, that's true. Yeah, that's why I have to keep buying cookbooks now because I'm like, I need to learn to cook things. You guys are not teaching me anywhere. Nobody's teaching me anymore. Um, it's awesome. But you, we did, we talked a little bit before about, you know, the crazy donuts that I'm cooking and stuff. And mm-hmm. so you said you like to bake as well. I do. I love to bake. What, what is your favorite thing that you like to bake? I like to bake, well, I like to bake lots of different things, but I like to make fancy cakes and do fancy cake decorating. Oh, beautiful. That's like the one yes. thing I can't, like, where did you start with that? Uh, so my mother is Belgian. That's the non-Italian half. And so she is, you know, all, all about the desserts. And so when I was growing up, she would make beautiful birthday cakes. Like remember those doll cakes in the eighties where it's the, um, you know, the, the round skirt is the cake and like little, the creepy little dolly head on top. And then, (laughs) yeah. So, uh, she made those and then also learned how to make buttercream icing flowers. And so, yeah, I, I love to do cakes. That's really fun. Yeah, the stuff I make usually tastes pretty good, but it never looks good. I've just not gotten that. I don't know what it is. I do not have that part down. So I'm I much admire that gift. That that is pretty cool. But I do have a very serious question now. Um, so you're part Italian, part Belgium. You love mm-hmm. pasta and your mother baked cakes, but you are not 500 pounds. So I'm just <laughs> wondering how that even happened right there. I think. Part of it is, uh, so thankfully I got a high metabolism from the Italian side. <laughs> and also uh, I have anxiety and exercise helps. <laughs> I also have ADHD and um, I take stimulants. <laughs> so it helps too. Yeah. Yeah. If, if only uh, ADHD encouraged me to exercise, that's the problem. I tried yoga and I get bored. Like I can't oh. do it. I can't yeah. concentrate long enough. No, yoga is not really my, I like, so I like restorative yoga, which is basically like yoga nap time. Well, that's just called nap time. I mean, I don't need another label to, I have no trouble sleeping. I'll tell you that right now. As much as I admire what you do, your specific kind of help, I will never need. Sleeping, no issue for me. (laughs) No, No, I do tend to go with, uh, go for things like Pilates um, I love. And also I, uh, I do weights and I like weights because it's a way that I can challenge myself and grow. And also, I mean, I have like, I have awesome arms. So. You do. Holy moly. Nicely done. Thank you. Yeah, very cool. Very cool. Um, this is about our entertainment. Okay. They're still talking about Smashy and I switching. We have to wait till <laughs> William's older because I am not going to parent the way that she will like. So we have to wait. <laughs> we have to wait. Um, 
But um, you were awesome, Cecilia. I hope you had fun with us. Um, yes, so I thank would you like so to much, know, Kelly. Where can fans find you and your work? Well, you can find my books pretty much everywhere they are available. They are widely distributed. You can uh, find more about me and get a list of my books and book order and everything on my website, which is ceciliadominic.com, C-E-C-I-L-I-A, dominic.com. And um, I spell out Cecilia because there's a C-E-C-E, Cecilia, which confuses people. So I always have to spell that And Dominic ends in a C. There's no K after it or anything. Exactly. It's just Mm -hmm. D-O-M-I-N-I-C. You can find me at Cecilia Dominic Author on Instagram. That's where I tend to be on the socials. Um, And then if you're interested in sleep and also in um, associated things, um, I have a book called Better Sleep for the Overachiever. And you can find me on Instagram at Psych Up Academy. And you can also there take a quiz on what kind of procrastinator are you? Because, of course, I can't do just two things. I have to do another thing as well. So I've started online courses and coaching for creatives who are high achievers, but need a little help getting out of their own way to achieve their creative projects. Okay, Light, I do need you. I need that one. Okay, excellent. Okay. <laughs> excellent. Well, now that Cecilia is your new favorite author, please make sure to review her work. You can also review us wherever it is you get your podcast. And you can follow us on Twitch and subscribe on YouTube. And next week, we will be with Mallory Wanless. So we shall get to meet and read about her awesome stuff. We'll see you then. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs>